Oh, my dear friends, one sign that tells us that we are approaching the holiday period is the amount of time that we have to queue up for things, whether it be queuing up in the supermarket or the department store or other places or even driving on the road. And we know that this is only getting busier. And especially for those of us who are blessed with children and grandchildren and taking the little ones to theme parks and other touristy areas, places like that, it can be so very time consuming. And, and we hope or we wish, you know, those places, some of them, they do actually offer fast passes. And fast passes, those things are particularly useful in those times as we can pass all the queuing up, uh, passing all the busyness, the wait and straight to the destination. Well, my dear friends, as we continue on in our series of studies in the book of Second Kings, this is something that we can see uh, in this chapter, chapter 15. There is this rapid movement in kings rushing at high speed. And it is faster than the fast pass. Because in this chapter, what we see is the space of 30 years. And this is indeed so, there's so much uh, happening in this uh, rapid succession of kings. Even though... It is traveling at such a high speed, uh, uh, it is not rushing to anything great, but rather the exact opposite. And so let us begin this sermon. Title for this afternoon is this, The Fast Track to Ruin. The Fast Track to Ruin. And by God's grace and with his help, we shall be studying the whole chapter of chapter 15, and we shall... Uh, Look at it uh, under the three thoughts. Firstly, the certainty of God's word. Secondly, the concerning signs of, uh, of God's judgment. And thirdly and finally, the continuous disintegration against God's word. The fast track to ruin. The certainty of God's word. The concerning signs of God's judgment. And finally, the continuous disintegration against God's word. <clears throat> Well, my dear friends, as mentioned before, this chapter covers a huge period of time. And it is not only uh, covering one kingdom like in many previous chapters. No, we, what we see here is that it covers both the kingdom of Judah in the south and the kingdom of Israel in the north. And in the beginning of the chapter, we are told about Azariah, king of Judah. And once again, we need to be reminded of the fact that Azariah and Uzziah, they are the same person, just different names. And in fact, this is not the first time that we have encountered a situation like this in our studies of kings. And then we are also told about the next king of Judah, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, and that we will read more about him in the last part of this chapter. But then, in between the two kings of Judah, in the middle of it, we're given the information about the northern kingdom. In fact, the five kings of Israel, one after another, one after another. And through that, we see a lot of discouraging circumstances. There is once again a lot of bloodshed involved, a lot of violence, a lot of conspiracy, coups and assassinations. And yes, there is a lot of focus on the northern kingdom in this chapter because the nation itself is on that fast track to ruin, to their own demise. Things are really, really falling apart. Destruction is waiting for them. And so let us look at our first point, the certainty of God's word, the certainty of God's word. Well, even though the main focus is on the northern kingdom, nevertheless, we are first taken to the southern kingdom. 
and this is concerning the reign of Uzziah. And we can read from verses uh, 1 to 3, as it says, in the 27th year uh, of Jeroboam, uh, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old uh, when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah of uh, Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father, a Messiah, had done. And yes, as we come to this King Uzziah, it is uh, tremendously useful for us to be also reminded of which prophets uh, who ministered uh, in those period, those particular times. For example, from our previous study, we looked at the reign of Jeroboam the second in the northern kingdom, and we know that the prophet Jonah served during that period. And so already we see that the major and the minor prophets, they are not in a different period, uh, say, completely after the kings. No, not at all. And why is it important for us to know, this, uh, to know these things? Well, because it doesn't just give us the proper understanding regarding the timeline of both Israel and Judah, but the major and the minor prophets, they give us the comment commentary, as it were, regarding those times. In other words, it is far beyond having the parallel accounts in first and second chronicles alongside with first and second kings there are a lot of prophets involved and so even for Uzziah there is not this is uh, not just the uh, historic records in second kings and second chronicles in the word of God we also have the word of God spoken through the prophets in those situations in those circumstances and when we think of the name Uzziah, we may be reminded of the famous chapter regarding the vision of the throne room of heaven given to the prophet Isaiah. Remember what he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. That was in Isaiah chapter 6. And in first, uh, one we are given the timeline. In there, in the year that King Uzziah died. Whereas in the north, we have not only the prophet Jonah, but also, as we briefly looked at last Lord's Day, the prophet Amos, and also the prophet Hosea. And this, I hope, would help us put things in its proper context, both Israel and Judah. And so with King Uzziah, we see that in verse 3, we are told that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But once again, we are given the condition and the standard. It is not to David's standard, but to the standard of Amaziah, Uzziah's father. And so, generally speaking, well, he has shown a degree of orthodoxy in his reign. And his reign of, in fact, it's quite long, just a uh, over half a century. And, and in, that, in that we see that period of time, Uzziah stands as a bastion of stability. And it serves as a stark contrast. You know, on the one hand, we have the reign of Uzziah compared to the reigns of the five kings in the northern kingdom who uh, come and mostly go during uh, the reign of Uzziah. But that's not it. Regarding Uzziah, even in 2 Kings, we are not only told about a degree of orthodoxy, we are also given some details about his blemishes and his sins. And we see that in verses 4 and 5, it says, except that the high places were not removed, the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Then, the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death. So he dwelt in an isolated house and 
Jotham, the king's son, was over the royal house, judging the people of the land. Friends, once again, we have come to that familiar phrase quite a few times already. And we come here once more. The high places were not removed. Uzziah is simply content with that mediocre orthodoxy without a true commitment to the Lord. As we have looked at in the previous sermon, this is not a light thing at all. Because this is concerning that which is the most important to the Lord, his divine worship. Just like with his father and grandfather, the spiritual stumbling block has not been removed. The king still allows his idolatry to continue on. And indeed, my friends, one of the marks of your and my commitment to the Lord can be seen in in the way we regard the divine worship of God, in how we divine, uh, regard the worship of God, whether it is in the meeting house or whether it is in our own homes. And this is a challenge to you and to me, especially as we live in a world that is full of many different distractions. Those distractions are competing for your and my devotion and worship. But with Uzziah, it is not simply the high places not being removed. There is something much worse. And we are given a reverence there in verse 5. We are told that the Lord struck the king with leprosy. And here, the writer of 2 Kings assumes that we know the backstory recorded for us in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. In fact, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, the whole chapter uh, there is about King Uzziah. And it is there we are told about the reason why. Why the Lord would strike the king. And in verse, 10, uh, verse 16 of 2 Chronicles chapter 26, uh, we are told that the king's heart grows very proud. So proud that he is willing to disobey. So proud that he's willing to abandon the word of God regarding God's worship that he offered incense on the altar of incense in the temple in Jerusalem. And perhaps as we come to read about this burning incense, we may wonder, we may be wondering, well, what is the problem here? Why is the Lord striking him? Well, King Uzziah. Look at him, he's not burning incense on those high places, but he's burning incense in the temple in Jerusalem. He's burning incense in the, in the worship of the Lord. He's well-intentioned, is he not? So why? why? Why does the Lord strike him? Friends, the problem is that the king has gone beyond the word of God in what God has commanded regarding his worship. Burning incense in the temple belongs not to the king, but to the priests. The Lord has appointed how he is to be worshipped in his word. In other words, the king in his sin of presumption ignores the word of God. And in fact, this is not some kind of a so-called honest mistake. Oh, I didn't know it. In fact, as, as Uriah, the priest, immediately... As soon as he detects what the king was trying to do, immediately Azariah, the priest, along with 80 other priests of the Lord, confronted the king. And we can read in verse 18 in Second Chronicles chapter 26. They withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. They immediately tried to stop him. But how did Uzziah respond? Well, he refuses to heed the warning from the priests, ignoring the word of God once again. In fact, he becomes so furious and insisted to do that which is forbidden by God and in his word. 
And as soon as he was approaching the altar of incense, leprosy immediately broke out in his body. And maybe we are, we are wondering, why leprosy of all diseases? Why leprosy? But friends, think about leprosy. It is a contagious disease, so disabling. The skin, the body parts can fall off, and the, even the face could, uh, dis be, could be disfigured, or even nose and ears can fall off because of that. And remember, in those days in Israel, the leper, they would hear that they would have to immediately run away from the leper. And not only that, they can no longer live in the family home with their loved ones. They would have to be quarantined in the leper's colony. And this is what is happening to King Uzziah. He can no longer attend the worship of God in the temple. And in fact, he is removed from the king's palace as well. Friends, do we see how great the sin is? Tampering with the worship of God, abandoning the regulative principles of worship is not a light thing. King Uzziah thinks he could get away with it. He could do whatever he wants as he's given the authority as king. But in his pride, he refuses to acknowledge the true king of Israel. And he has no regard for his divine worship. And how sad it is, for the rest of his life, he's taken away from the worship of God. He's taken away from his kingship, really. Every single day as he looks at his own, at his own body, the disease of leprosy is a daily reminder of his heart disease of pride. And yes, even in this, we see the mercy of God. Yes, even the mercy of God in this. Because King Uzziah should have been struck down from the face of the earth, not just struck with leprosy. And indeed, my friends, we are not simply called to look at the situation as some mere history. Because the world that we live in is no different from those days in Judah. Not only are there are so many high places, but even within the wider Christian church, there are so many attempts in undermining or tampering with the, uh, the divine worship of God. For, this, for what? For the sake of pleasing man, for the sake of numbers, at the expense of displeasing the Lord in going beyond what God has commanded, appointed, for his own divine worship. Friends, how often we hear about people in the wider Christian church saying something like, well, that worship style suits me. That, I don't like the other way. I, I like this one. It makes me happy. It makes me joyful. It makes me uplifted. All of that without thinking that God should be the one first and foremost to be pleased, to be worshipped. And in saying that, in saying that, biblical worship is not a killjoy if we consider how pleasing it is to the Lord. And this should give us joy, dear congregation, in knowing that what we do by faith according to his word pleases him. And in here we see the certainty of God's word. For he has never altered his word or his mind regarding how he is to be worshipped. And so it comes as a challenge to us. Especially in our postmodern culture. Where feelings, emotions seem to rule as kings. Whether we, should, whether we would seek to stick to the word of God. And to seek that joy, that true joy in obeying his word, in obedience and in humility. And not only do we see the certainty of God's word in relation to King Uzziah, we see that certainty of God's word in relation to the northern kingdom as well. With King Zechariah, and we can read in verse 8, it says, In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah the son of Jeroboam reigned over Israel in Samaria, Six months. Yes, here in King, 
uh, here is uh, King Zechariah, the great grandson of Jehu, and he has one of the shortest reigns in, uh, uh, in the northern kingdom, only six months. And he was assassinated by Shalom, and that marks the end of the dynasty. And, uh, and we are given the explanation in verse 12. It says, this was the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Jehu, saying, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it was. Friends, here we are reminded of what God has promised Jehu. Back in chapter 10, verse 30, that a four generation dynasty would be given to him. And King Zechariah is the last of that dynasty, just as God promised. And it is interesting to see, at the end of verse 12, we read the four little words, and so it was. The exact phrase that came up, actually, in Genesis chapter 1, six times, concerning the power of God's word, because he spoke that which he spoke, came into being. And that is the point here, the certainty of God's word. Just think about the northern kingdom at this moment. There is so much chaos. There is this assassination, conspiracy, violence and bloodshed. There is so much instability. Humanly speaking, so many reasons to be afraid, so many reasons to be worried. But yet, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of uncertainties, there is one thing that stands as the sure rock of confidence for the people of God. The sure promises of God in his word. And dear believers, don't we need to be reminded of that too? As our world is full of chaos and uncertainties, our lives as well, with and with and without. But one thing that is the bedrock for the people of God is the, is the word of God, the same word of God. God's promises are yea and amen in Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God. And so, dear child of God, I uh, when we go through those times when we are shaken to the core, at times by our changes in our circumstances, in those times, dear child of God, do we go to that bedrock? Do we find hope? Do we find our assurance not in the word of man, not in a possible change of an outcome or an, in a, our circumstance, but in the word of God, centered in the unchangeable Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is comforting. Even if, as if the world is, even if the world is going to fall apart, there is one thing that is sure, the word of God, that we can lay hold of, dear child of God. And secondly, we see this concerning signs, the concerning signs of God's judgment. Yes, as mentioned before, the northern kingdom has entered into this period of uncertainty and chaos. For the people in the northern kingdom, perhaps, well, after that long reign of Jeroboam II, they may expect Zechariah would replicate that long reign for the nation, but no. What we're seeing in this period is that there are both internal and external signs of the coming judgment. Friends, let's think about the internal issues and signs. I mean, from verses 8 to 31, that section, verses 8 to 31, we have five kings, and four of them are all plagued with conspiracies ended by cold-blooded murder. And all of them were very brief in their reign. And as mentioned before, Zechariah only reigned for six months. And then Shalom, one full month. And after that, uh, Menahem. Uh, well, that time, this time for him, longer, ten years. Pekahiah, two years. And then Pekah, twenty years. Yes, all together, just a wee bit over thirty-two years with so much chaos. 
And in fact, the prophet Hosea was instructed by God to speak to the northern kingdom about this kind of national crisis. In Hosea chapter 7, verse 7, Hosea 7, 7, all of them are hard as an oven. They devour their rulers, all their kings fall, and none of them calls on me. Why? Because they have been abandoning the Lord. Why? Because they have been defying the Lord. And in verse 13 of the same chapter, Hosea, we read of the word of God through the prophet, Woe to them because they have strayed from me. Destruction to them because they have rebelled against me. I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. And yes, God has sent his prophet, giving his divine commentary of what is going on with the nation. He's telling the nation that this is not simply some political uncertainty. This is served as a warning to the northern kingdom regarding their defiance, regarding their disobedience. Israel is on that fast track to ruin Friends, as we know, to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty in this world is a divine gift from God. And so it is, the withdrawal of that is served as a warning from the Lord. And it is also an invitation to call upon him, to lay hold of him. And this is what we're seeing right now internally within the nation. But not only that, there are also external warnings. And that is in the form of Assyria. Assyria. Just look at the reign of Menahem in verses 19 and 20. Verses 19 and 20, it says, Paul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Paul a thousand talents of silver and his hand might be, that his hand may be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. And Menahem exacted the money from Israel, from all, that, <clears throat> all the very wealthy, from each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Syria, Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. And yes, in here we see Paul, king of Assyria. And indeed, Assyria at this time in Second Kings, Assyria is not any micronation. It is an empire. It is a superpower in those days. And their army is well known for their brutality and hostility. And indeed, it was a threat to the northern kingdom. And so in the attempt of keeping these Assyrians off his back, Menahem paid the king off for a moment of national security and stability. Friends, do we see the amount of money that has been paid? It is an extraordinary amount of silver. A thousand talents of silver. Do we know how much that is? A thousand talents of silver equals to 29 million Australian dollars. That's how much it is. Yes, it worked. The Northern Kingdom had a period of stability and security, but it was only for a short time. And indeed, when it came to Pekka's time, the fifth king of the Northern Kingdom, during his, uh, this time, his, his time, there is no greater amount of money to offer because by that time, when it came to the fifth king, the northern kingdom would be on the brink of bankruptcy. And so what did Paul, also known as uh, Tiglath, Pelissar, king of Syria, what is he doing this time? Well, we read of what is happening in the middle of verse 29. And he came and took Aijon, Abel, Beth, Makkah, Janoa, Kadesh, Hazar, Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. Yes, a tighter squeeze has been put on Israel. And this time is an invasion. The five northern towns have been captured, but that's not it. The whole land of Naphtali as well. In other words, the Assyrians have got the area east of the Jordan 
as well as the west and north of the Sea of Galilee, a big chunk of the territory of Israel is gone, just gone. And if that's not bad enough, the last part of verse 29 tells us that the Assyrians have exiled the population in those places to Assyria. And so in here, we see invasion and deportation from the Assyrians. Friends, do we see the depth of the grief and the sorrow here in this one word, captive or exile? This is far beyond a historic event. Can we think about the people of Israel in those cities and regions? They have been living there for centuries. That's where all of their livelihood is. And now they have to be resettled, not of their choice, but being forced to go to a place, to the place of the enemies, to find a new home away from their culture, away from their language, away from the promised land. Parents would be so grieved to see their children would be sold as slaves to serve those cruel masters. And can we also imagine their neighboring towns and places in the northern kingdom? They would be seeing from afar those occupied land completely emptied by the enemies. And in all these of these things happening, God is sending them his prophet with a message. Yes, the prophet Hosea was commanded by God to preach to the northern kingdom in the midst of the devastation. Preaching that message of hope. There is hope. The only hope is in the Lord. In in Hosea, Hosea chapter 13, Hosea 13 verses 9 to 11 we read, O Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king. Where is another Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes? I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Yes, God in his loving mercy and kindness has been willing to pledge himself to be the king, their king. But the people, the unfaithful bride, have been pushing him away, refusing his kingly rule, rejecting his word. And therefore God in his wrath has sent this Assyrian king to come as that conqueror, as a tool of God's chastening, warning them of a future judgment if they do not return to him in repentance and faith. Friends, this is not something that God has suddenly decided to do, out of the blue as it were. No, not at all. God has written in his word, warning about the covenant and faithfulness of Israel. If uh, the covenant nation refuses to repent, an exile is one of the covenant curses recorded back in Leviticus chapter 26. And yes, the Lord has been calling the nation through his prophets one after another, calling them to repentance. But they have been pushing his gracious hand, throwing his gracious word away. But time and time again, they have not returned to me. Do you remember that? We we read of that repeatedly in the book of Amos, especially in chapter 4. They have not returned to me. And yes, this message is not only applicable to the church of God in the Old Testament. This message is still very relevant to the church of Christ down through the ages and us included. Indeed, the Lord still sends his messengers to issue this call to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need it not only as individuals, we need it not only as a congregation and as a denomination, but in fact, the wider church needs us also more than ever. And so how have we been responding to that word? Is it by the grace of God, by faith alone, in humility? Or have we been ignoring the call from the Lord to seek his grace and to repent and stay by day in Christ, refusing that? 
How sad it is to see that many churches in our land and abroad, many of them were once known for embracing the true religion, but they are now rejecting the authority of God's word, refusing to affirm biblical moral standards. Instead, they would go against the word of God and to bring worldliness into the church and to lose all its saltiness and brightness. And to see that one word, Ichabod, Ichabod, is written over many denominations. Do we lament? Do we grieve over the state of the wider church? And do we plead with the Lord for grace? Grace to stand firm in his truth. Grace to lay hold of Christ despite the pressures, despite the temptations of this world, despite the fiery attacks of the evil one. Pleading that the Lord would continue to be pleased to walk in the midst of the candlesticks of our congregation and denomination. Rather, that praying that the Lord would never, ever, in his mercy, write Ichabod. The glory of God has departed over us. And it is so sad to see the state of the northern kingdom in our passage. In these kings, we see something so prominent. And that is our third and final point. The continuous disintegration against God's word. The continuous disintegration against God's word. My dear friends, we see something that has been repeated four times in our passage here. In verses 9 18, 24, and 28. The same words. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. Yes, these kings may have different backgrounds. They, yes, they may have different family lines, different personalities. But the one thing that they all have, they all share in common, is that they are sharing the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, in that counterfeit, idolatrous calf worship. My dear friends, the first time we read about Jeroboam, about that counterfeit worship, was back in 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. Where are we? 2 Kings chapter 15. And that Jeroboam would transgress and sin against the Lord's commandments Especially the first three of the first tablet for what? For political reasons. Why did he create his counterfeit religion? He wanted basically to stop people from the north to travel to the south to Jerusalem for worship. He didn't want to have any mingling so that he, to consolidate his control. And therefore he has set up different places of worship other than Jerusalem. He has set up different priests other than the sons of Levi and he has created other holy days which the Lord has never ever appointed and by this time in 2 Kings chapter 15 do you know how long it has been over 200 years two centuries the grip of this counterfeit worship is still running through the bloodstream of the northern kingdom and Israel is so deep in this spiritual bondage, so enslaved by this uh, generational sin. And indeed, the situation in the northern kingdom reminds us of something that is plaguing. Not only the hearts of the, of the people of the northern kingdom, something that is plaguing every man and woman, every boy and girl after the fall. And it reminds us not just of the sin of Jeroboam, but the original sin of Adam and we in him. And the only one who can rescue us from that idolatry, from that counterfeit worship of this world, is not any king of the northern kingdom. Even Jotham from the south is not sufficient. He did not remove the high places. And it's a reminder to us that we need the ultimate true king of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who alone is able to break the bondage of idolatry, the bondage of sin of his rebellious people. 
Yes, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is faithful unto the end, the perfect King who did what was right in the sight of God the Father, in whom He is well pleased. And he is the one who can enter into the temple of God to offer not just incense, but the perfect sacrifice of himself for sin as the great high priest by the, his shed blood on the cross. And it is he who is that almighty prophet who doesn't just speak God's word, but who himself is the eternal word of God, the most willing and able prophet and teacher to a stubborn, rebellious, foolish, sinful people like us to make us wise in his salvation. For he is able and willing to bend our wills, to change our hearts, to make us willing in the day of his power and to flee to him in repentance and faith. Oh, my dear friends, have we come to know him as, as the Christ, the almighty prophet, priest, and king by the grace of God, to come under his kingly rule? Because without him, as our only salvation and redemption, what we shall face is far more than an earthly exile, but eternal judgment in hell. And so the Lord in his mercy calls us to his son, for he alone is a true refuge to an undeserving people, not only for time, but for eternity. But for those who know him, for those who love him, dear people of God, let us stand firm in the truth of God's word, in our life and practice, and in our worship, as the apostle Paul exhorted Timothy, watch your life and doctrine closely. As someone says, the destiny of those years later may depend on it. Amen. Let us conclude our worship by singing from Psalm number 2. Psalm number 2 from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 2. And we shall be singing from verses 6 to 12. Psalm 2, verses... Six to 12. Yet notwithstanding, I have him to be my king appointed. And over Zion, my holy hill, I have him king appointed, anointed. And, uh, and who is he? The king, the true king, the Lord Jesus Christ. The sure decree I would declare. The Lord hath said to me, Thou art my only son this day. I have begotten thee. And, and there's this exhortation in verse 12. Kiss ye the son, lest in his ire ye perish from the way. If once his wrath begin to burn, the blessed all that on him stay. Blessed are those who in him trust. And so may we stand and to sing to his praise. Verses 6 to 12.